it. Okay. Yeah. There, that, that's it. Wonderful. Over to you. Okay. Thank you. For, thank you. Thank you again for inviting me. This is the second talk in a series of three for my three books. So last month we talked about old boys, this month, What Disturbs Our Blood, and next month, Dreaming Sally. And they're a thematic trilogy of creative nonfiction. They're all intimately connected, um, very deeply personal stuff, but also uh, public issues of increasing importance. Um, so so the, What Disturbs came out 10 years ago in 2010. And uh, as I was just saying with Maggie, that it's, it's now uh, catching up to the times or the times have catch up to, caught up to hip because of, because of the pandemic. And uh, I'm hoping actually right now I am pitching with a producer and a director a four part series to the CBC as a documentary based on the book because of the dovetailing of public health issues um, infectious disease, but also with mental health. So as I said to Maggie, we have this pandemic within a pandemic now of, of I think the World Health Organization says depression is now the number one affliction in the world globally. So these things are intimately connected and, and that's one of the themes of my book. So this will uh, give you some insight, I hope, into what's going on. And, and there's some hope, there's a silver lining of this. This is a pretty dark story I'm going to tell you but I think there is uh, some light in it. And uh, the idea of recurring cycles of history that what happened a hundred years ago, there was a mental, there was a public health crisis and mental health crisis and what the elites did to address it magnificently, the, the success of public health is sort of underappreciated. And uh, so that's the, that's the upside of the story. Okay, so the book's something of a multiple personality. It's a, it's a nonfiction, but it reads like a novel. It's an intimate family memoir, but it's also this uh, sweeping piece of Canadian me medical history. And it's also a kind of cautionary tale of intergenerational trauma, um, high ambition, burnout and tragedy. But as I say, there's a redemptive element as well as we'll see. So on the cover, you'll see a three-year-old boy who happens to be me and I'm standing on the front lawn of my grandfather's Gothic house on Balmoral Avenue, at Sinclair and Avenue Road area in uh, 1953. Uh, the queen had just ascended the throne. That gives you perspective. Um, the house was built in 1914 by my grandfather, Jerry Fitzgerald, who was this driven doctor of Irish uh, Protestant blood who died 10 years before I was born. Now, his son, Jack, my father, Jack, grew up in the same house in the 1920s, and he too became an eminent doctor. So my sister, brother, and I were the uh, third generation to live in this house. Now, as I grew up, I had absolutely no idea of our grandfather's international achievements in public health, which is quite amazing. Uh, no one ever spoke of him. It's, it's like he didn't exist. Um, but from my, uh, the vexed expression on my face, you can see uh, I'm already the little detective on the case. So we could go to the next slide now. Great. So this is the house on Balmoral, my grandfather built in, in the 50s. Toronto was, of course, overwhelmingly white and patriarchal and puritanical, and Toronto the good, Belfast of the North, more British than the British. Uh, my brother, sister, and I were enduring Victorian childhoods of severe emotional coldness and neglect, um, a complete absence of bedtime storytelling, hugging or kissing, any kind of tenderness or physical affection. For long periods, uh, we were abandoned to the silence of the nursery uh, where my father had been abandoned before us. I mean, it was as if we were being quarantined. Um, we talk now about social distancing of six feet. I, I knew what that was all about in my childhood. <laughs> so um, I suffered uh, in the first years of my life intense night terrors. And I carried this as a child, a kind of pervasive sense of the uncanny and the schizoid. And I was preternaturally quiet as a child, uh, uh, almost semi-autistic, uh, kind of classic self-holder. Um, my mother told me a story 
later in my life that she said that when I was age five, I marched home from kindergarten at Brown School one day and I came solemnly up to her and I said, I would like to change my name from James to Jerry, my grandfather's name. And she practically fell off her chair because that name was never mentioned in the house. So, so children are like dogs and cats, <laughs> they, they pick things up. Um, then when I was seven, the family moved a couple of blocks north onto Dunvegan Road and into, into Forest Hill into a less haunted house. And um, things got a little brighter at that point. Uh, okay, next slide, please. So here's my father, Jack. Uh, he is now in the 50s and 60s, busy pioneering the specialty of clinical immunology, uh, teaching medical students at the U of T and running his own thriving private allergy extract laboratory at the Toronto Western Hospital, uh, treating uh, hay fever and uh, asthma and so on. He was a real pioneer in that field. Um, so we took on the trappings of an upper middle class lifestyle, a three story house, two car garage, swimming pool, European vacations, you know, private school educations that, that works. So we were privileged, uh, materially at least. Um, now Jack had an artistic side. He, he identified with outsiders, um, his Irish part, I guess. In his youth, uh, he was a passionate jazz fan knowing many of the greats personally from Django Reinhardt to Oscar Peterson. Uh, as a young medical student, he would bring the entire Duke Ellington Orchestra or the Count Basie band back to the house on Balmoral where they would have all night marijuana parties. Now, this is pretty risky business for a young white doctor to consort with black people in those days and let alone the, the drug taking. I mean, he could prescribe it narcotics. He would, he would get them hard drugs if they wanted to. Now, I didn't hear this from him, of course. I, had, I, and, and, uh, I didn't hear it until much later either, but that's the kind of double life he was leading. So he was a kind of this, my father was this strange hybrid of rigorous scientist, loose-limbed hipster, and completely, uh, abs utterly absent father. Uh, he wouldn't eat at the same table with us even, it's like he didn't exist. So then in the 1960s, uh, during my teens, uh, I watched my father collapse into a classic midlife crisis. First, he had a nervous breakdown, and then he fell into a profound depression. Uh, in 1970, when I was 19, he barely survived two suicide attempts by injecting morphine. Uh, the, the second time my sister, older sister Sheila found him and saved him in the nick of time. And I'm, I know that if she had not intervened that day, there's no question he would have died. Um, now, of course, this had a seismic effect on our family, um, generating waves of shock and shame and stigma and mostly silence. Um, initially, I wasn't told what happened. Um, uh, tacitly, you know, society still, not as bad as it was, but society still teaches us to deny and repress such disgraceful things. Um, I think this really was my, my father's tragedy in essence was that he should have followed his bliss, as we used to say in the 60s, and I think he, he, I think he would have run a, a chain of jazz clinics and been amazing at it, and not, not an allergy, a jazz club, sorry, not an allergy clinic, but a jazz club called Fitzgerald, I and mean, it would have been amazing because he knew everybody, he had the connections. Um, but he was, uh, he, he just couldn't break, fr break free. He was perpetually laboring under the shadow of his absent yet oppressive, yet magnificently accomplished father figure who uh, was placing these great dynastic expectations on my father while at the same time withholding his love very powerful kind of double bind he was in. Um, I, I think of the, the famous Irish proverb, uh, some people reach the top of the ladder only to discover that it's leaning against the wrong wall. And that's, that's my father's situation. I mean, when I was doing my research, I remember I, he was at pre-meds at Cambridge and I, I found a note that he had scribbled on a jazz handbill and he wrote in his hand, Jack Fitzgerald, the living lie. That was in 
amazing. He, he knew it, but he kept going. So after the suicide attempts for the next few years, he was brutally psychiatrized, as I call it, with a battery of shock treatments and drugs. And this in essence made him worse, not better. I know because I was able to obtain his clinical files and they, they don't make for happy reading. I published them in the book. Um, at the Clark, he received 10 rounds of electroconvulsive shock, which the file very coolly reports that produced an extensive, an extremely adverse reaction. That's a euphemism. He was then transferred to the Donwood Institute where the admitting psychiatrist noted, Dr. Fitzgerald has enough drugs in his system to kill a horse. The long list included alcohol, amphetamines, Valium, Secanol, migraine medicine, 222s, morphine, and that was just the self-medicating. Then came an added layer of prescribed antidepressants and antipsychotics. No one was suspending my father's prescribing privileges as a doctor because of course his livelihood depended on it. And uh, the treatment strategy was to here to get this sort of a game of whack-a-mole, hammering down his outward system, uh, symptoms and getting him back to work. But anybody who could see, could see work held no longer, it had any meaning for him anymore. It was, it was, it was meaningless to him, to his job he had reached the top of his profession. He had done it. He's, and he's 50 and it's over. Uh, he was then transferred to Homeward Sanitarium in Guelph, Ontario, and the new set of psychiatrists failed to consult the Clark file because he was given a second round of 10 electroshocks. And they noticed, wow, another wildly adverse uh, reaction to this. I mean, this is shocking, sorry for the pun, but just outrageous. Um, the psychiatrist in chief, a man by the name of Dr. Story wrote, quote, Dr. Fitzgerald must learn to cover up his feelings. I, I, I read that and I thought that has to be a chapter heading in my book. Um, Dr. Story was not interested in Dr. Fitzgerald's story. Um, my father was this, you know, quirky, idiopathic jazz hipster, kind of an Irish ball of mercury, and he was not going to be pinned down by some diagnostic label. And so his symptoms kept shifting with the wind. Um, they were constantly slipping and sliding and morphing. One minute he's this, and that minute is that, and they kept trying to put labels on it. And, and they didn't realize that they were having an effect on his behavior. Um, so this led the psychiatrist to label him, quote, treatment resistance, resistant. This is his problem. He's not playing ball. He's just not being, you know, behaving properly, normally. So the more that they saw him as being uncooperative, the more they twisted the thumb screws. They got more aggressive with the treatments. Eventually, they drove him into the back, back ward of Homewood, where he went into a psychotic state. He wasn't psychotic when he went in. He was reaching out for help. Then they proposed a lobotomy, 1972. They, proposed, they didn't do it, thank God, but they, they sat around the table and they said, how are we gonna deal with this guy? Let's, let's cut his brain open. It was incredible. Anyways, as I was, so, as I was growing up, um, my father never talked about Never talked about his lonely childhood in boarding school up the street, age nine. You know, his, he never talked about his combat experience as a naval officer in World War II. He never talked about the painful divorce from his first wife. He never talked about the loss of his first son in a custody trial. He never talked about our Irish roots. But most of all, he never talked about his father. So, as a by university age. Um, it seemed to me that you know everyone, including the medical profession, were sort of ignoring the elephant in the room, um, the influence of my powerful yet invisible grandfather on my father, and of course on me. Uh, the next slide, please. Bear with me. I'm just trying to push buttons, and nothing's happening. <laughs> 
Okay. Oh, we missed one. There it is. Yep. Okay. This is this is my parents' wedding photo, Janet and Jack. So one day, here I am, 19 years old, trying to figure all this out, and I I just went up to my mother and I said, "What's the story? Did did my grandfather Jerry kill himself?" And I remember she just nodded slightly, sort of, yes, but there was no discussion, no information, no who, what, when, where, why, and the sort of the tacit in, in, in you know, the, the implicit message was, you know, nothing to see here, move on. You know? And so I did. I thought, well, it doesn't affect me else. So I just sort of, but I don't, th I think if I hadn't added that question, if I had not challenged this, I don't know if I'd be, be here today, if I colluded with all of the repression and denial. So in my 20s and 30s, I worked half-heartedly in journalism and book publishing. Maggie can attest to that, my half-heartedness. <laughs> um, I was working for her at that point, one, in one job. And I, I wasn't actively suicidal per se, but I was certainly spinning my wheels, both uh, professionally and romantically. I was living I, sort of a, a simulated as if life, you know, uh, just not really sure who I was or where I was going. Uh, I had a, a chronic case of Crohn's disease since since high school, when, since I was 16, and I was kind of abusing it and denying it. Um, now, only later did I realize that both my father and my grandfather had reached the peaks of their professions, yet they ended up crazy and or dead. And so I had a eureka moment later that said, of course, no wonder I'm feeling a kind of success phobia um, in a family of over of achievers. I was sort of a conscientious underachiever to, to save my own skin. Um, so you know, go big or go home was the great uh, unspoken family motto, kind of like the Kennedys. Uh, but in my case, it felt more like go big and go crazy. Um, in the 70s, my, my, my father was now separated from my mother, languishing alone in a shabby one bedroom rented apartment where he would remain for the last 20 years of his life, flatlined on lithium and endless hours of television, a kind of death in life. Uh, he had essentially kind of given up the ghost at this point and resolving never to make himself vulnerable, feel vulnerable again by asking for help and who could blame him. Now, ever since childhood, I'd been having these recurring dreams and nightmares. Many of them were still set in the Gothic house in Balmoral. And by my early 30s, I was feeling this mounting pressure uh, to, to break this, this monolith, this silence that was kind of choking my life energy. Um, I was still very conflicted, driven with conflicted feelings about my father, this, this figure who had been a stranger from day one. And I had long suppressed all my own loves and hates as he had done with his absent father. But given my father's experience, understandably, I wasn't going anywhere near a psychiatrist. You know, They were clearly, it was worse. The so-called cure was worse than the so-called disease. Then at uh, age 33, uh, following a painful romantic breakup, I, f I had to really force myself to confront myself and, and take a risk and, and face down my own demons. And uh, after a screening interview, I was referred to a man named Peter, who was a gifted psychotherapist. And I paid a modest fee tied to my modest income. And uh, Peter was not in it for the money or the status or careerism. He wasn't a medical doctor. He wasn't a psychoanalyst. He wasn't a clinical psychologist. But then and he was an eclectic, psychodynamically trained lay lay person, um, a former high school teacher um, who worked out of the basement of his uh, house in the annex. And it turned out I was lucky where my father and grandfather weren't. Um, in my sessions with Peter, I called him the rock. <laughs> I experienced no medical jargon, no verbal psychosurgery, no dispensing of advice. Uh, rather just the exchange of plain, honest, humane, face-to-face -face language. 
if I had presented myself to the Clark Institute at that time, I have no doubt I would have immediately been pinned down with a pathologizing label or medicated or worse um, and not talked to. Um, I, was, I was never told with Peter that I had a quote, mental illness or a disease. Um, it just never became part of my identity. This was just not part of the story. Um, now I can understand why some people might feel relieved to receive a psychiatric diagnosis, but I can equally understand why other people might experience a label as just another form of stigma. And I was one of those people. Now, uh, meeting Peter was a turning point for now I felt I had found a trusted ally in a guide and a guide in my quest to confront my family secrets. I couldn't do this alone. I needed help. And I, with Peter, I was simply allowed to explore my inner life through a steady and sustained dynamic of talking and listening and dreaming and reflecting and feeling. I was always in the driver's seat, completely different from the medical model. Uh, maintaining my own agency and my own dignity. I was given the time and the space to hear my own voice. Uh, uh, my, that's my brother calling. Um, I was given the time and space to hear my own voice and intuitions in a safe, private and confidential setting outside of a, a dehumanizing hospital environment. I was allowed to feel whatever I needed to feel, grief, rage, tenderness, anguish, joy, gratitude, without judgment, uh, without wallowing in victimhood. And it led me over time through a powerful chain of healing epiphanies. Um, and I, I, was, I was claiming the strengths that I didn't know I had, but I'd always had them. They were just buried. Now, early in the process, I had a vivid dream. This was like in the first week when I saw Peter. I think this was a watershed moment I had this amazing dream of a doctor in a white lab coat comes towards me with a scalpel in his hand and he makes a vertical incision down the middle of my face and it releases this Niagara-like torrent of water. An amazing image. And Peter wasn't interested in, he wasn't gonna interpret it. It's your dream, you know, he was more like a midwife for a mirror. So the answers are within you. Peter doesn't pretend to know what it meant. And, uh, but it meant something. And I, I, I unpacked that dream for a long time afterwards. I mean, at one level, it was repressed grief. My Irish forebears, all the men in my family going back generations, all backed up. And only later, I think it was sometime later, then I realized that it contained my fear and my desire. I trusted Peter consciously, but there was an unconscious fear that he'd become a lobotomist, that he'd become a psychiatrist, and he'd take a knife and open up my head. So the dream is both a hope and a fear. And as it over time, I, I just more and more deeply trusted Peter because he wasn't, the, I was transferring to him as a doctor. I was transferring to him as a father figure, doctor figure. And I was able to break down that transference. No, he's Peter. He's not that guy. He's not my father. That's essentially what a lot of really good therapy can do. Bring you back to reality um, and, and calm down your fears. So it was this very process that is healing is the point I'm making. Um, So this, this was a really galvanizing dream and I was uh, had many, many more after that. I realized that dreams are, are really underrated, that they're, uh, they're not just some abstract concept, this, the unconscious, uh, that but actually can be practical guideposts to living a more aware life, what, what's really going on down there. Um, so gradually, I, the process I was allowed to, I unlocked myself as a speaker and a writer and it was the slowness that was really essential. I had to do it at my own pace. And um, by the early 90s, I was, so I was going down two interconnected streams. I was doing my first book, Oral History in Upper Canada College, which I talked about last time. And uh, that was one stream and, and then researching my grandfather. And so, uh, was really the search for the father. The book on Upper Canada was all about fathers and sons, really. It was about this, a school filled with absent fathers. Um, and so now uh, I've got my, my dream diary uh, therapy, and now I'm gonna, okay, I made, I vowed, okay, now I'm gonna go after this. And I, I just dove into 
uh, medical archives, interviewing doctors and historians. Who was this invisible man, Jerry Fitzgerald? Oh, next slide, please. I'm getting there. Oh, two. There. Is that the correct there one? Yep. There. there he is. Yep. Yep. He's age 29 in this photograph. So as I, as I said, as a child, all I knew was that Jerry had founded, I was told later in my teens, like he had founded a laboratory they'll call the Connaught, the Connaught Labs. That was it, the name. I had no idea what it was all about. So as, as I start delving into the archives, I'm, I'm just amazed to discover that he was this you know, Canadian hero, a, a visionary of international stature, a dynamic inter innovator, uh, driven by this passionate ambition, moral vision, really. He was the uh, eldest child of a melancholic small town Ontario pharmacist and an invalid mother fated to die young, uh, which gave me a clue to his caretaking personality. Uh, he entered the University of Toronto Medical School at the precocious age of 16, the youngest ever in the history of U of T Medical School. And then he just, looking at his CV, just blasted off on this remarkable trajectory, um, career trajectory. It's, and I'm looking at this, and I'm thinking he's in the same league as, you know, Osler and Bethune and Penfield and Banding and Best, but nobody's ever heard of him. There's no biography. It's, isn't this wild? Oh, okay, uh, next slide, please. So in my research, uh, I discovered that before World War I, Canada was just rife with uh, all kinds of infectious diseases, smallpox, syphilis, tuberculosis, typhoid, puts COVID-19 to shame. We'd, we've forgotten how bad it was. Uh, infant mortality rates were 20%. One in five babies died in childbirth. Um, we had a very primitive, uncoordinated, reactive public health system. It wasn't really a system. We were really mired in third world conditions. We're talking 1910. So just to pick one example, diphtheria was killing thousands of kids. It was number one killer of children, decade in, decade out, thousands. And if you were wealthy, you were lucky if you, your parents could pay for a very expensive imported American antitoxin with something like $80 a dose, which was like three weeks fees for the average working person. So it was out of reach for most people. So it was largely the poor who were dying. Um, now, diphtheria was really gruesome, far worse than COVID. I mean, it was a toxic membrane clogged the child's throat and they essentially suffocated to death as the parents watched helplessly. Um, so, and, and the mortality rate was much higher. It was like 15% than, than COVID. So my grandfather naturally is, is appalled by this, that, that this has sort of been allowed to go on for years. And so he was this now this man on a mission. And uh, for three intense years, uh, he trained in Europe and the US at elite institutions in Harvard and Berkeley in the Pasteur Institute. And this is him at the Pasteur Institute in 1910 on the right. There's a man injecting somebody with an experimental vaccine. So here he is rubbing shoulders with Nobel Prize winning scientists. And here he is germinating his idea for a grand vision for building Canada's public health infrastructure. Uh, so when he returns to Toronto and three years later in 1913, He's ready to pitch his big idea to you to the University of Toronto, and he's 30 years old. So he says, I will make, he pitches the Board of Governors, I will make high quality, low cost vaccines and antitoxins himself, because he's the only one who can in Canada. Then we're going to distribute them free nationally through local boards of health, free to the poor as a public service. And that's how we're going to wipe out diphtheria and, and other diseases. This is sort of just be systematic about it. So this is a precursor to Tommy Douglas and the universal care, so universal health care. So this, this idea was unprecedented in the world at the time because no academic institution, U of T, 
gets involved in manufacturing, commercial manufacturing of biomedical products, a university. This is normally a capitalist enterprise. Um, the next uh, slide, please. So uh, the U of T didn't decide right away. They, they needed time to consider it. So he was very impatient. He said, kids are dying. So he raced ahead and borrowed $3,000 from my grandmother's dowry. And he built this barn in the annex on Barton Avenue. And he bought some horses. And he made Canada's first diphtheria and he talks with his own hands. And it was very, very dangerous. One little germ of it could, could kill something like 50,000 guinea pigs and 10 men. It was just very, very dangerous work. And you, you, you'd use the blood of horses. Horses are immune to diphtheria. So you would make an antitoxin from the horse blood. Um, this was a, in McLean's magazine, the miracle factory that began in the stable. So there was kind of religious overtones to this achievement. So finally, U of T saw that he did it and they got very impressed. So they opened up the Connaught Laboratories, which was born in the basement of the medical school in, in 1914. And then luck of the Irish, two really powerful historical accidents gave the lab a huge boost. Uh, the first was months later, it was, it was, the lab opened in May, 1914, August, 1914, World War I. And so now there's suddenly this crushing need to inoculate thousands of Canadian troops on the Western Front. And who steps forward but the medical philanthropist, Sir Albert Goodrum of the Goodrum and Wartz Distillery Empire. It was the largest distillery in the British Empire. And he was a medical, so he gave my grandfather, this young man, uh, money and land and buildings. He gave, he gave him a 57 acre uh, derelict farm up at Dufferin and Steels for, for the animals and uh, $100,000 in cash, get to work. And um, very quickly, it turned into this dynamic wartime factory pumping out millions of doses of all kinds of medicines, you know, meningitis, rabies, everything for the, for the troops. And it had an incredible effect of reversing the stats in World War One. In the old days, you know, eight soldiers would die of a disease for one killed in battle, and the Connaught just completely reversed that. Um, amazing achievement. So that so that's why the lab grew so fast. Uh, the next slide, please. This is a remarkable photograph taken in the fall of 1919 outside of Old City Hall on Queen Street. And uh, Toronto was going through a small, smallpox epidemic that winter. And this is the anti-vaxxers of 1919. <laughs> because the local, the medical officer of health, John Hastings, said, got very, very, uh, came down hard with the lockdown idea that we're going through today. And he, he was right to do this, but he, he really kicked up a fuss because he said, uh, parents who didn't comply to the, a compulsory vaccination, smallpox vaccine, if in the, to children, the, he would expel the children from school. So the parents got upset at this. And my grandfather helped the cause. He stood in public, he, he injected himself at his medical class and, med and injected all of the medical students to show that it was that the vaccine was safe and cheap and effective and it worked and there were there were just a handful of cases that winter and they injected I think they vaccinated 200,000 Torontonians and it worked and uh, this was just a, a one in a series of events that the lab was doing okay, okay the ne next slide please So then just two years later, we're up to 1921 now, another massive historical accident that uh, the lab is only seven years old. Here we have Jerry's colleagues, Fred Banding and Charles Bess, suddenly make this epic discovery of insulin in the U of T Medical School in a lab two floors above Jerry's office. Um, they were his, had been the medical students of his. Uh, so now suddenly my grandfather is scrambling to mass produce insulin for the world, millions of world's diabetics. And the, the fledgling cannot was now suddenly cast into the international spotlight. It's a, an amazing story. This is only one story among many. Uh, so, and Jerry pay, played the pivotal role of facilitator and peacemaker uh, 
among the fractious cast of characters. There were actual fist fights going on. It was a really rough story. And uh, Charles Best later declared, quote, there would be no insulin without Fitzgerald. Uh, insulin won Canada's first Nobel Prize, um, but it's really only one feather in the cap of the lab, a big feather, but um, beginning in the 20s, early 20s, Jerry and his colleagues are now systematically starting to wipe out diphtheria and dramatically reducing the incidence of many other infectious diseases. Toronto and Hamilton eventually became the first cities in the world to be free of diphtheria and not being, and they weren't, people weren't being charged an arm and a leg for it either. So the next uh, slide, please. This is just another sidebar story. There are so many stories, but this is just another example of one of many. This is my father, Jack, on the right, age five, and my aunt Molly, his sister, age seven, age eight, sitting on a horse at the Connaught Farm in 1922, the year of insulin. That horse was also named Molly after my aunt. That horse, one horse, was responsible for producing all of the meningitis serum for the entire Canadian population from 1916 to 1924. So it's amazing. Okay, next. Uh, that's on the Connaught Farm land. Yeah. Part of the story too was, of course, education. You have to educate people to trust the process, right? So my, my grandfather had this massive glass lantern slide collection, which I discovered up at the, the lab when I was doing my research and it's hand painted. So this is both beautiful and gruesome. Uh, these children are all blind because of gonorrhea. So he would give lectures to doctors and to the public, educating them about uh, in, in, infectious diseases. Okay, next. Uh, so by the early twenties, all of this, uh, these dramatic successes were attracted the attention of the Rockefeller Foundation in New York City. You know, what were all these backwoodsmen up in Canada doing, you know, punching above their weight? What's going on up there? And so John D. Rockefeller Jr. donated $1.2 million in 1924 uh, to create this school of hygiene. This is at 150 College Street at U of T. And this is only the third such uh, school in the world after Harvard and Johns Hopkins. Um, so Jerry now became the head, and this is the academic arm of the lab. So now we have this triad of research and teaching and manufacturing of the medicines, all seamlessly integrated under one roof as a public service. And this is a global first. And this sort of gave Canada a competitive advantage. It was the seamless integration that was unique. And, and so amazingly, within a single generation between the world wars, Canada leapt from a colonial backwater rife with deadly diseases to literally the world leader in public health and preventive medicine. This was considered the lighthouse school in the Rockefeller system. And so it was reversing the brain drain, foreign students were now flocking to Toronto. Um, and this, I always sort of see this as a kind of typical Canadian achievement, synthesizing the best ideas and technologies from older cultures, Europe and the States, and then synthesizing and then driving them up to new levels of, of innovation and excellence. Okay, uh, next uh, slide, please. It's important to understand that the cannot, it wasn't just about biotechnology and vaccines, it was a holistic vision. Uh, and it was, this was just far ahead of its time. So he incorporated nutrition. He was really fascinated by nutrition, exercise, sanitation, you know, the immune system, all these interrelated system uh, disciplines. And so we actually had mandatory sports on the roof of the School of Hygiene. That's, the, that's Queens Park behind there. So at noon, they'd go up there and pick off their shirts. And uh, oops, we got, and that's Jerry on the right. And so the, the motto's lab was in, in uh, men's sana and corpora sano in a, health, a healthy mind and a healthy body. And uh, in those days, there was a movement called mental hygiene movement, which he was a part of. This was essentially um, a kind of preventive, preventive psychiatry. So he was trying to integrate these worlds, you see. And uh, so, so he practiced what he, he preached by, by actually the exercise and the diet. Um, now, it also, the vision was wrapped up. You have to remember, these were essentially Victorians, these guys. And, 
they were wrapped up in the concept of noblesse oblige, uh, meaning that the privileged elites owe back to the rest of society. Um, Fitzgerald Bannigan Best did not claim a dime of personal profit from insulin. All of the revenues went back into research at the university. You don't see that today. This is, this is a value system that's long gone. We now have names. It's not the Fitzgerald School. It's not the Rockefeller uh, School of Public Health or the Rotman Business School. They don't, they don't brand it. <laughs> Philanthropy can be self-serving to some degree. Um, by the 1930s now, the, the Canadians were entering a golden age of public health. Jerry's now Dean of Medicine at U of T and working for the League of Nations. In one year alone, he traveled to medical centers in 27 countries to advise them how to elevate their systems to the Canadian standard, which was considered the gold standard and Jerry leading the way. So who knew? <laughs> You don't, Canadians didn't know, and I didn't know, and I'm a member of the family. Okay, next uh, slide, please. So early in my research, uh, I was intrigued to learn that before he was entered public health, my young grandfather had worked as a neuropsychiatrist at the infamous 999 Queen Street West Asylum back, this would be 1907, 1908. In this period, Louis Pasteur's germ theory of disease was all the rage. The idea was that perhaps a bug caused schizophrenia or manic depression as it did for syphilis. So here we have my grandfather, young grandfather, scalpel in hand, cutting open the brains of Irish paupers and lunatics in, in this building and for, in the fruitless search for the mythical germ of madness. Uh, but then I think he figured it out. He, he abruptly quit psychiatry. He was still in his 20s. And I think he realized that he had a much better chance of wiping out an infectious disease like diphtheria than he did with schizophrenia. Um, and so in 1995, after the publication of my first book, uh, in Upper Canada, I decided to explore the archives at Cam H, which is the old Queen Street place, of course. And up to this point, I was just not confident about writing a book because I still had no sense of my grandfather's inner life, no, so busy, there were very few letters, personal letters. Um, he was still very much an enigma to me. And I remember thinking, I need to make uh, the emotional equivalent of an insulin-like discovery you know, maybe I'll find a forgotten cache of letters somewhere and all will be revealed. And, uh, and otherwise I don't think I can pull this book off. And sure enough, we get what we wish for. And so I'm just gonna read you a section from the book. This was this thing. This is the turning point for me in terms of cracking some mysteries and getting the book done. Um, in early 1995, I ventured into a psychiatric archive on the site of the former 19th century lunatic asylum at 999 Queen West. I knew my grandfather had worked here in 1907-08 as a young neuropathologist succeeded by the Freudian champion, Ernest Jones. So it seemed a good place to start prying open the lid of Pandora's box. And so it was for here, miraculously came the breakthrough I'd been banking on. As the archivist handed me a folder marked Fitzgerald, I held my breath. Inside, I found 60 intense confessional letters written by my grandfather in 1939-40, the last year of his life. He was languishing in a private sanitarium in Hartford, Connecticut, being treated for depression in the wake of a failed suicide attempt. The letters were addressed to his close friend, Dr. Clarence B. Ferrer, the thin cerebral director of the Toronto Psychiatric Hospital, a forerunner of the Clark Institute where ironically, a generation later, my father was drugged and shocked into submission. Ferrer had died in 1970 at the age of 95. The letters had been donated to the archives the very week I walked in there by his second wife, a woman over 40 years, his junior. They've been sitting on a shelf for 45 years, unread these letters. To describe my discovery as coincidental seemed a desperately inadequate explanation. I had a lot of these experiences, a lot of amazing coincidences. Deciphering Jerry's semi-legible scrawl, we could uh, turn the, to the next slide now. We have, the, we have a, a sample of the letters. 
I, I strain to digest the feast and all in one sitting, 60 letters. Even as a vice-like pain encircled my skull in the corridors outside the archives, the strangled cries of medicated patients echoed like the soundtrack of a gothic horror film. The letters had been written a decade before my birth, yet the tone and idiom seemed so familiar and real and immediate. The distant unknown stranger who had occupied the haunted house that was my body was suddenly made flesh before my eyes, the past bleeding freely into the present, his soul laid bare before me with a near unbearable pathos and vulnerability. The lamentations of my grandfather, calling from the end of the 1930s, uncannily mirrored the voice of my father at the end of the 1960s. I'm reading this in the 1990s. Uh, the same slow slide into midlife crisis, the same anguished outpourings over the reversals of fortune, the loss of income and status, the upsurgings of panic and self-loathing, the helplessness, the hopelessness, the terror of being quote, second rate, the paralyzing indecision about whether or not to return to work, all chased by unrelenting thoughts of self-annihilation. The pair of drowning voices thrashed inside my head, fusing and confusing and making no distinction between the separate identities of Jerry and Jack, father and son. In fact, as the voices drilled and swirled and lashed, they awakened a third voice, the sound of my own primal dread. My grandfather's words were pulling me back to the austere Victorian nursery on Balmoral Avenue, the desert of hardwood floors where small children, generation upon generation, are abandoned under the wheels of the repressed. I felt part of some weird trinity of father, son, and unholy ghost that was following to me, the third generation eldest son, to stand and fight. Writing that was very therapeutic. Yes. <laughs> uh, the next slide, please. Oh, sorry, you could keep that slide there. That's fine. That's good, because we're still uh, on the letters. We can go back to the letter slide. Sorry, I was, I was rushing myself there. So in, these, in this letter, I don't know if you can read it, but he, he says, he obsessively repeats the haunting phrase, I have committed the unpardonable sin and the penalty is death. Remarkable. This really got my attention. He, kept, he keeps saying this and keeps writing this. He wasn't crazy, by the way, he's lucid but he's very distressed. Now, although he was uh, raised an Anglican, he was not really actively religious. He didn't have time to go to church. As his despair deepened, he asked to see a Catholic priest in order to vent and confess his sins, real or imagined. But shockingly, the psychiatrist refused. They hated Catholicism as intensely as Freud or Jung. Any form of exploratory talk, therapeutic or spiritual, was verboten. Now here's this highly accomplished man who had carved out a magnificent career, yet he's clearly consumed by a lethal form of shame and guilt. This is obvious. Why is this a problem? Tragically, this obvious fact was not respected by the doctors. In fact, but in fact, you see, his perceptions were largely correct. He was being judged. He wasn't paranoid. He was being judged, not just internally by himself, but externally by his peer group as a failure and a disgrace. He had indeed committed an unpardonable sin, the sin of male vulnerability. This was 1939, a world war had just broken out. And a leader of men does not crack under pressure or let down the side. World War I, they take you out and shoot you for this. So in addition to the letters, I was able to obtain Jerry's Hartford clinical files, as I did with my father. Now, this is, again, an, an irony a novelist would hesitate to invent. If this was a novel, no one would believe it. He suffered 57 rounds of a brand new experimental treatment called insulin shock. 
If you've seen the film, A Beautiful Mind, it shows its effects, comas, sweats, convulsions, broken bones, a kind of medieval torture. That's what its own creator called it, medieval torture. It was later discredited. But meanwhile, 5% of patients under that treatment died on the table, but they just kept plowing ahead in search of the Nobel Prize. Um, so here I am conf confronted with this cruel irony. The man responsible for mass producing insulin for millions of the world's diabetics was used as a guinea pig for a brutal experimental procedure uh, that was discredited, belatedly. Um, now my, my father had, when I discovered these letters, my father had died three years earlier. So I showed the letters to my mother and she said, her first response was interesting. She said, I found them repetitive. <laughs> and I said, maybe that's because no one is listening to him. <laughs> yeah, the obvious, right? Um, but then she did come through. She said, there's a, you know, there's a former Dean of Medicine in his eighties is out in a retirement home in Vancouver and he knew your grandfather and loved him. And uh, he might know something. Why don't you go out and see him? And uh, it turned out, you know, he might know the dark secret. Why has this been, why is this so repressed and denied? And it turned out my mother was right. And so I went out to him, I saw him. At first it was, he, he wouldn't talk to me. It was this haunting familiar experience, it was like my father. Um, I knew he knew something, but he wasn't going to tell me. And so I laughed and I went back a second time and I just almost demanded, I said, I'm the grandson, I'm entitled to know. And uh, so out comes this shocking revelation. And I, I have to tell you, it was shocking, but it was incredibly liberating. It was, it just, I felt like 20 pounds lighter. It was like, it was this validation that all these dreams and intuitions that I've been having since I was a child were correct. And uh, I was right. There had been a scandal and a cover up and a denial and a whitewash. His, his death certificate said that he died of a duodenal ulcer. So it was a lie. And um, so over, over these years, I had sort of become this, I said, I started to call myself an archeologist of silence. And, and so now I had got this eureka moment and now I understood why there was so much silence and why the medical profession colluded in the silence. This, this, it, was, it was a scandal, it was covered up. And, and now I knew, now that I knew I had a book to write. And uh, I always say, we, we tell our stories or our stories will tell us. And those of you who have read the book will know what I found out that day. Um, and I'm not gonna tell you now because it would spoil, it's, it, it, you know, the tension of the book leads up to this scene. So the next slide, please. Um, so my grandfather's extraordinary public legacy, his integrative idealism and pragmatism was achieved at the cross at this terrible cost to himself and his family. His younger brother committed suicide two years later, the same age, jumped off a bridge. His other brother was at Queen Street. His daughter, Molly, was at Homewood for 12 years. So it was really, really bad. And uh, the repression of my grandfather's suicide, I think, drove his reputation underground and uh, his achievements. Him, the amnesia that we have both for the public health crisis of 1910, we've, we've forgotten public health just did so well. And, uh, but we also forgot, I think we, we, that his, the stigma of his suicide partly explains the silence. And in 1972, when he would have been 90, had he lived, the University of Toronto controversially sold the Connaught Laboratories. Uh, it was sort of a victim of its own success and it was broken up and privatized and they, U of T's realized later this was a this was a mistake, and uh, so uh, they had controlled most, eradicated most diseases. So as I say, a victim of his own success. So post seventy two, we started to slowly erode our global status in public health, and only with the unanticipated emergence of AIDS and SARS and the contaminated water scandal at Walkerton did we start to slowly realize. Uh, we've, we've got to fix it again. And so in 2008, recognizing their miscalculation, the U of T established 
again with philanthropic support, the Dalalana School of Public Health, uh, restoring a standalone public health institution across the street from my grandfather's original. And then, as you know, COVID lands. And so irony of history. Um, and we, we, we've read in the press over the last months, Prime Minister Trudeau publicly acknowledged that we had dropped the ball, that here we were, we used to be world leaders in the field. Uh, in the 1980s, the Connaught uh, Labs uh, mass produced, uh, was the world's largest producer of flu vaccines in the world, not just for Canada, but for the world. And then Mulroney sold it and uh, we, we plummeted. So the, the, the wheel of history kinds, kinds of turns full circle. Now there's talk of getting a public lab back. Uh, remarkable, eh? So next slide, please. I'm aware of the time here. I have a whole lot more to say. I wrote, I wrote a lot of homework or to sort of at this point talk about what I've just said. So maybe this is the time to start talking, but I was gonna make a lot of comments about um, bringing together the mental health and the public health stuff. Uh, I know it's 2.30, so maybe, maybe this is a good time. Sorry about that. <laughs> Should have oh. taken the phone. Okay, no problem. So, well, do you want it to have a chance for a question and answer? Sure. All right. Yeah, yeah. that'd be great. Because I mean, you, 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 you give it almost like I'm needing to have, have you come back for part two. Uh, you know, the yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> I, know, it, I, have, I have another, I have another ten pages of stuff to say about that, but I, but, but the Q and A is good. But, but this is so relevant to our, our reality. I mean, when, when I was sharing with someone, because you mentioned about the, the anti-vaxxers of, 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 of that time period. They said, well, were there vaccines then? And um, you clearly have said, yes, there was. So, I mean, clearly we've lost part of our history somehow. And so- That's right. Uh, so enough of me, I think pe other people likely have questions. Uh -huh. And so uh, I'm, if you want to unmute yourself and uh, jump in, uh, ask away. That's uh, fascinating. I'm going to have to read that book. It's. Uh... It's, it's a very interesting, both your talks have been focusing on what early Toronto was like and, and not a pretty picture. No, no. It was, as I say, it's a cost exacted for the achievements, right? Like that's, mm. that's what it's about. It's, I mean, there was a great achievements. I mean, uh, Malcolm Gladwell, the writer said, we forget, but public health is the greatest single success story of the 20th century globally. Yes. But we sort of take it for granted, you know, like the seat belts and the anti-smoking legislation. It's boring. It's under the radar, but it saves millions of lives. And the, the surgeons in the emergency room doctors get all the credit because it's more sexy and glamorous. Mm -hmm. But it's public health that really. And, and so we forgot 100 years ago with the Spanish flu. Right. I didn't mention that, but that killed something like 100 million people worldwide. It's just, it was people repressed and forgot the horror of that. I mean, you had hemor you hemorrhaged when you had Spanish flu, you, you bled to death, your lungs. I mean, it was just a, it was a Cronenberg movie and people didn't write about it or talk about it because it was so, every country was affected. And, you know, so we repressed that memory, but the, see the cannot came up to meet these challenges. And as I said, within a generation, this, that's what's spectacular is the achievement. Mm -hmm. But we sort of forgot that too. <laughs> Right. And so here we are, a hundred years later. Like um, it's Roundhog Day, you know. <laughs> Susan, you had another question. I, I'm laughing, but it's it's tragic, right. you know. The, and this is where the politicians, you see, Doug hmm. Ford banging heads with the public health doctors. It's a political thing, unfortunately. Yeah, I was just going to point out how we seem to seem to think that we've always had what we have now. It's like you know. Someone would say, well, why didn't you just go get a, a, a shot for this? It's like, we didn't have it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And that's, again, it was a holistic. It isn't, it isn't that simple. That's the public health doctors are falling down. The, the messages we're getting about social distancing and masks, it's all good. But they're also not saying enough, my grandfather would have said, eat, sleep properly, take care of your immune system, you know, 
like there's healthy things and walk in nature and there's things you do that keep your immune system strong. And that's all part of the story. You just don't rely completely on the biotechnology, mm -hmm. right? And unfortunately medicine does that. There's just still kind of a magic bullet thinking, especially in psychiatry, which is tragic. You know, they were just gonna make an inter medical intervention into your brain and you won't be depressed anymore. This is incredibly misguided. You know. but jo Joanne, it looks like you want to ask a question. Well, I just thought it was quite remarkable that your grandfather entered medical school at 16. And it, yeah. it makes you wonder, it makes you wonder what his elementary, like his elementary school education was like. I mean, he was clearly really smart, but but in addition, like it sort of lets you know that maybe there's something to be, there's something lacking in our elementary school system now too. You know, that's an excellent point. There's Back no then, the education they got was superior. They got classical education. Even in Ontario, they had amazingly good, you know, great Latin and science. And see, in the 1890s, when he was in high school, Louis Pasteur was all the rage, right? He was, so he was riveted by that story. And he also, by the way, worked in his father's apothecary shop in this village. They were making pills by hand. So he's, he's an apprentice at 15 and 16, making these pills, right? Which so you would not be allowed they're to do failing today. To no. <laughs> they're, they're failing mm -hmm. to save his invalid mother. You can see. So he's saying it's not working. So he gets obsessed with prevention. Mm -hmm. You can see the influences on him as a young man. Mm -hmm. And he's gifted, of course, too. So it's just, that's why he was like a racehorse. I liken him to a racehorse, right? Yes. And he had a vision like 30 years from now, and he was, had the vision, then he fulfilled it, mm -hmm. you know? But he sacrificed himself. There's almost a, a kind of, uh, it's like myth, mythic quality to this. It's the, the degree of self-sacrifice to the point that he gave his life to this. Mm -hmm. But he, he, that was his tragedy. They didn't understand himself enough. He was so type A plunging forward, you know? And I, and I went the other way. I became very inner and self-reflective. No. If there's no indication in the letters that he suffered from the same sort of um, uh, dis disconnect between his scientific mind and his artistic mind, like there's no, there's no suggestion right. of that in his letters. That's right. Very, very good. You see, and I think my father tried to address that because he, he his love of music and the arts. You see, that he had that. My my father was his sensibility was like that. I'm amazed that he achieved what he did in science because it was sort of against the grain, but he was kind of coerced into it. My grandfather really pressured my father to go to medical school. Like there really was no choice. Yeah, but your dad was um, not. And so you're right. Like your dad was extremely capable in medicine as well. Like it was not, he didn't just coast in any way by the sound of it. No, no he worked his ass off. It, was, it wasn't easy for him. It wasn't, he wasn't as gifted as his father at science but he worked really hard because he had something to prove to himself but it cost him because he like his father like the migraines and the you know insomnia and the, and the body the toll on the body and the psyche you know was huge like my grandfather has started having duodenal ulcers and insomnia and, and that and, it's, and he physically cracked up first like he his body just gave out after his world tour for the League of Nations in 1937, he came home and he looked white, his hair turned white and he'd sort of conquered the world. Now he's the world superstar in public health. Now, where do you go from here? He's 55 years old, but he looks 75 in his pictures that they could see the difference, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's what's tragic that I think he could have been helped with the right kind of people who understood his drama. You know, I understand it now, of course, I didn't at the time, but there were people back, even back then in the thirties you know, who understood this, who could have helped him. I'm convinced of this. Um, so, so Jane, but he ironically was hoist on the petard of this over-reliance on biomedical, biological, because they were all, you have to forgive them because they were so excited because insulin was this miraculous, right? Yeah. Miraculous thing, insulin. So you, you sort of understand why they would try to shock people with the, people out of their depressions with it, but it was a, it was a terribly misguided thing to do. Well, and depression even now in the brain is still so like they get it, but they don't. I mean, they don't totally get it. Yeah, sort of. They're throwing a giant. That's right. SSI That's right. Bomb. They don't see it's about relationships. Yeah, yeah. Are there questions from people? Yeah. Yes, I, I'd like to ask James about his uh, 
pursuit of the documentary with CBC, because if we ever needed yeah. anything, we need the life of Jerry Fitzgerald told now. Yes. Can you tell us more about what's happening there? Exactly. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a challenge because I've been trying for 10 years to get a documentary made. And uh, it's only because of the pandemic that people are starting to listen. <laughs> say, oh yeah, maybe, maybe we should. <laughs> so uh, uh, this, is part of the, this, is, this is part of the story. You know, Canadians are, we're a weird race. You know, we are, we still have this self-effacing, what? Yes. We're world class? What do you mean? Not really. We, we have a hard time digesting this. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, uh, but the story is also very Canadian because we have the dark, we have the dark side with it. You see, we have that the, about the idea of our, our inheritance of repression, that we all also are, are a repressed race. We live in a Northern country. This is part of our history too. We have great gifts, yeah. but we have this part. This is also true of us. Yeah. And this is why I, I'm proud of the book because I go after both things. They're, it's hard for people to connect them without judging, you know, yes. uh, that they, to try to see the connection that it's that's what ironically my grandfather was trying to do he was trying to he was an integrationist mm -hmm. but it was intellectual for him he didn't live with the very thing he was i said he practiced what was preached but he didn't really he, he needed to talk with his he needed a peer group that he could talk with like you and i had maggie right mm -hmm. like yeah. that you could be real emotionally but back then mm -hmm. it was the, this is why we're going through what we're going through isn't it that the attacks on the patriarchy are in some sense well uh, taken you know mm -hmm. that men are suffering from as much as women yes. in a, in a yeah. patriarchal society right yes. that men taught to repress their emotions and uh, there's this shaming and the stigma so powerful even now we're, we're, we're it's better it's, it's out there now thank god we're seeing much more addressing of this but you're quite right maggie that it, this, i'm hoping that this would be a four-part documentary if we get it cbc this is another irony the producer told me uh and he is a quote privileged white male like me. He's made a hundred documentaries. He made people Canada People's History about ten years ago. He's very accomplished. But he says he just made the documentary an inconvenient Indian because CBC is only accepting docs by on black or indigenous stories. So white stories are out. <laughs> CBC TVO right now that that's across the board with the broadcasters in but, Canada. But, but to your but point. You fine with that like I'm, I'm yeah. completely fine with that they're great stories but he's saying we're going to do a lot we're doing a lot of work without any guarantee this will get made because we have to pitch it we have to write a script yeah well um, keep it, this this could be a cbc if ideas it is going to happen it's going to be two years earlier but as a cbc ideas program it would be easier to to, to navigate towards production than a full-on documentary it could be a seed for a documentary is because as, as you know, with CBC Ideas, they could interview you and you could be doing exactly what you just did. And that could lead into the next step. I mean, I, I don't know how that goes about, but uh, just a thought because it, it's less complicated. But I'm just aware of our time and um, thank you for coming. It's a, and it's been remarkable. We're, you're coming back again, I think, because uh, is it the end in, in March, I believe. Yes, yes. And yeah, and then next week we have Dr. Julia Shaw, the history of post World War II Toronto Protestant churches. Well, that's going to be quite fascinating too. Let's we'll see where that goes. So now, Susan, you want to just say a farewell to everyone? Yes, thank you again all for coming and uh, please spread the word. Uh, I think if you've enjoyed this, I think other people will too. And hope to see you again next week. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Yeah. Thank you.